Hello, everybody. I'm Ms. I'm a star. And I'm Nathan Little. And you're watching Beauty. And the Bear. The show that proved Snuffleupagus was a gay icon. And that big bird, he was hot. But let's see what fluffy woodland creatures we're interviewing tonight. On this week's episode of Beauty and the Bear, Nathan says, What you talking about, Willis? To dance floor maestro DJ Josh. Ms. I'm a Star compares leotards with dance legend Lee Warren. And to start the show, Nathan Little compares beards with cabaret star Selena Jenkins. Uh, I definitely do character comedy a lot, mm -hmm. um, so predominantly dress up as male characters. Um, I do some drag king work, but only a little bit because I'm not actually very good at miming and learning the words to other people's songs, so I do sure. mostly original work. And I'm in a, a ridiculous Britney Spears tribute band. Awesome. Um, it's just like an all-girl glam rock type project. And, uh, and I do some solo singing just as me. So the Britney character is a uh, flip side to your Bo Heartbreaker character? Yeah, it's just about polar opposite. Yeah, and sure. Bo uh, Heartbreaker is a farm boy. Iconic Australian yeah, character. Yeah, yeah, really iconically Australian. So everything you'd expect, but with a really, like a big sensitivity. You mm -hmm. know, he's not a... He's not a sort of hyper-masculine guy. He's not a thug. No, he's not a thug. He's not a thug. Really though. needs a girlfriend? Really needs yeah, anything he can get, I think. Yeah, is, there, is there any parallels between, between his life and yours? No, not so much. I mean, I sort of grew up in the bush and I definitely have a really strong relationship with my folks, but other than that... Where, where know, did you grow up? Uh, just out of, not far out of Melbourne, in the Danny Knolls. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. kind of small town, really beautiful, you know, visually beautiful environment, but still that small town sort of attitudes and... And what was it like growing up queer in a, in a small town? Well, it was really bizarre. I never came out um, where I grew up. I certainly shaved my head. I certainly was a real big tomboy and everyone else knew probably before I was sort of aware of it. Um, I moved to the city pretty quickly, to be honest, to get away from there and only go back to see my parents. Um, it's beautiful up there, but I don't spend a lot of time sure. with that community. It's, you know, it's hard, I suppose. You know. How did um, your gender bending begin in terms of performance? Because I guess you would have had quite a uh, quite a stretch of just singing straight non-comic. Yeah, non absolutely. I probably performed, sort of did the Melbourne um, female folk scene for years and years and years from quite an early age, from about the age of 15, and was in bands and all that sort of stuff. And then um, I don't know, about eight years ago, I went and saw one of the first Drag King shows that was put on in Melbourne and, um, and I was really femme at the time. I had the long, long hair and the big cleavage and, and, um, and all that sort of stuff and, and went up to the organiser and said, oh, I'm really interested in doing a show as a, as a boy and she sort of looked me up and down and, and kind of was probably pretty dismissive at that point. And then I came back a couple of weeks later dressed as this creation that I'd dug out of my wardrobe at home and, and said, hey, I'd really like to give that kind of performance genre a go and see if I'm... I really like, just like being on stage. I really like being the centre of attention. And so it was kind of just another avenue to do that, I suppose. What was that first time like? Um, was it nice to have the mask on? Yeah, it was. It was heaps of fun, actually. It was nice to explore that real hyper-masculinity as I sort of perceive it to be as a woman. And, um, and it became really evident, I suppose, within about the first minute of that performance that I had to do something that was comedic, mm -hmm. you know, that I wasn't really going to pull off the serious sort of drag king character. So, um, and it was great getting laughs and it was really great feedback and then it sort of just developed from there, I suppose. Did you know that you were always funny? No, 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 no. I never thought I was funny. Um, and I certainly never had any intentions or even ideas that I'd sort of move into the area of comedy at all. I was always, I'm a musician, I write songs, I play music, that's kind of what I'll do. And mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it's always, it's, it's just really nice to interact with audiences. And I think comedy really allows you to do that mm -hmm. on a really sort of open sort of level, you know. And how great is it to get people to laugh? That's great, it's fantastic. And I, but I certainly, um, I mean, the characters, are, the characters are very funny, you know, that sort of character developments. They're really, really amusing because it's, they're sort of ironic and they're sort of clumsy and, they're, you know, they're, they're lovable. So that's funny. And I certainly never considered myself funny without that mask on. And I recently, um, during Adelaide Fringe Festival earlier this year, was, was at a venue and sort of someone said, jump up and do a spot. But I wasn't dressed as Bo, I sort of had the big sandwich board around my neck because I'd been handing out flyers all day. So I got up on stage and just said, this is what 
I usually look like, so I'm just going to do a bit of a spot. And if you just keep looking at the sandwich board, <laughs> you know, you might. And it, and it worked out really well. I probably won't do that. I can't That's imagine. That's a good myself. idea, a sandwich board. I've a big been... sandwich board around your neck, hold that around the whole of Adelaide. Not that you'd need one these days because you won Best Cabaret. This is in a year. You won Best Cabaret in the, uh, the Melbourne, Melbourne French, French Festival yeah. and Best Cabaret for Emerging Artist yeah. in the Adelaide French which was Festival. Which is great, which that is a is huge incredible. boost, which is really, really good. And it's really nice to know that people enjoy what you do, full stop. And if you love cabaret, don't go away, because Selena will be back at the end of the show singing her own original song, My Space Junkie. But if you want to indulge your addiction, check out www.beautyandthebear.com.au featuring podcasts, podcasts, and rare footage you won't see on the show, such as Ima, a spatula, and a donkey. They told me it was a cooking show. But we'll keep cooking right after this short break with celebrated choreographer, Lee Warren. Welcome back to Beauty and the Bear. Thank goodness for TV commercials, giving us a little moment in each day to consider our place in the universe. Our place is here, and your place is there. But where's Lee Warren's place? Oh, right next to me, right now! Hello everybody, I'm Ms. I'm a Star, and I'm here with Lee Warren, famed choreographer. Feel happy with the title famed choreographer? Mm, that'll do, that'll do, that'll do. Infamous would be better. Welcome to the show. Thanks. And let me great. start by saying congratulations on your Ruby Award uh, for best sustained contribution, is that right? That's right, yeah. So was... did you cry like Miss America? No, I didn't. But I have to tell you, it felt really, really good actually because I have worked pretty hard over 20 years and it kind of went like that you know and I've I've been really lucky in Adelaide to work with some fantastic people. It's interesting talking about the you know getting some recognition especially for a choreographer and a director you know in talking to other choreographers it seems like sometimes in Australia they don't get a lot of recognition in comparison to I guess some of the other art forms. Yeah I'd, I'd say that was that was true um, I think Generally, people don't know what a choreographer kind of does um, and how kind of involved we are in kind of so many different ways in, in the theatre and film and television everywhere. On one level, who cares? But on the other level, um, yeah, it's, it's great when a bit of recognition is, you know, coming a choreographer's way. I it's a good thing. And what are your thoughts on, um, you know, the current feeling that there's a bit of a dance explosion happening, i.e. there's a couple of shows on television oh, that yeah. celebrate dance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you actually think that that does draw young people towards a career in dance or does it give them the right impression as well, I guess? I'm not sure if it draws them to a career, but I think it's a fantastic thing. I think it's great because it kind of um, normalizes what in Australia is called an elite art form. Um, it's fine to be an elite athlete, no problem there, but if you're an artist and you're elite, terrible thing. And you do get to see how hard those young people work. You get to know what a choreographer does mm. and how important they are to that process. Um, so it, it's a kind of positive demystification. Yeah. You find when people have been watching uh, So You Think You Can Dance, suddenly they know all these dance terms and yeah. they're using it and critiquing the dance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually I got, I got a shoulder injury um, working in rehearsal for the last production and so I actually had a workers comp claim and I had for the first time I was interviewed by a forensic accountant. I thought, what the <clears throat> is that? But you know, they, they do exist. Anyway, I, I said to him, you know, I'm like, he said, well what do you do? You can't be a director of a company and a career, you know, what, 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 what is that? And I said, I said, have you seen So You Think You Can Dance? I, I'm a choreographer. Ah, he said. <laughs> said the forensic scientist. Ah, oh, now I know. One of the things I find interesting about you is that you, you did have a, a quite a substantial dancing career. N you know, not every dancer becomes a choreographer. And, uh, and a lot of them, I think, move to choreography quite quickly, but you had a very substantial career. Yeah, it was 14 years, I suppose, in Europe and America and, um, and UK. So yes, it was. But I think it takes virtually your first 10 years to begin to pick up all the, the stagecraft and, and, and really how things are put together. Um, I'm a believer in kind of the go slow process. I, I think 
you, you become enriched by all those different experiences, no matter what they are, whether it's a commercial gig or whether it's working with somebody really famous and wonderful. And so you have that to bring on, you know, to the work later on. Whereas if you, you sort of switch into it really early, it's kind of shallow, that experience. And, and I think you, you really have to work hard. And often you get people who have that one hit, you know, but then they can't sustain it. And so they, they drop away. I mean, one of the other kinds of collaboration that I think you're pretty well known for is, I guess, giving other choreographers a chance to work with your dancers and letting your dancers experiment themselves with um, starting to choreograph works for themselves and others. Um, how do you think that's actually fed the company? Or has it? Well, it has, absolutely. Um, because it's the way our legacy in our particular art form progresses. And it's essential that, that performers have more than one source of, of uh, a, you know, one, more than one choreographer. So they can reflect on what those differences are. But it's also your connect, once you've worked with a choreographer, you're connected to that lineage and that when you've made work, it's imprinted on your body. You know, it's there forever because you've, you've physicalized something that was an idea and you've memorized it in, in literally in space and time so that you can retouch it and bring it back if you want to uh, at any time. And that's how the encoding process uh, happens with dancers. And the diversity of that process is really, really important for future development. What was it that first inspired you to become a dancer? To to, did you actually think to yourself, I want to pursue that career? How did it actually happen? I think it was actually my first drag number. I rem the earliest dancing thing I remember is m my grandmother um, lived quite a long time. My father was born in Fiji. Um, so there was this wonderful grass skirt that my grandmother had and she used to sing these Polynesian songs to me as a kid. And I must have been about seven or so. And, and I think I've got this picture of me with this grass skirt tied around my neck with the arms out trying to hold it up and she's singing and I'm kind of going. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the picture. I'm gyro and I've, I've got this clear memory of this at my grandmother's house with her singing and me kind of doing a little kind of Watusi number on the back lawn. Um, that's my first, first memory of dancing. And I've, um, I'm told by my parents, I, I don't know if it's true, but the, the, the minute I would hear music, I would rip my clothes off and start dancing. And this occurred... And some people would say, <laughs> nothing's changed. <laughs> well, I have my moments. But um, this would happen at, you know, the church, at weddings and baptisms and things. I would just be found kind of naked, jumping up and down the back of the church. And so they thought, mm, Maybe we should get this boy to a dancing class. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee. It's been great talking to you. Pleasure. And I look forward to seeing your company performing something fabulous in the very near future. Thank you. Gosh, dancers must be flexible. You know, I can't touch my toes, but apparently putting them behind my ears isn't a problem. And while you all go and drink a bottle of Domestos to get that image out of your minds, we're going to take a little break. Good idea. Hello and welcome back to Beauty and the Bear, the show that dances to music that nobody else can hear. And someone who must have seen a lot of people do that in their time is one of Australia's most celebrated DJs. And one of my personal favourites, DJ, DJ Josh. Josh. You've won numerous, numerous awards mm -hmm. for DJing. What are yep. some of the highlights? I mean, the list is just too long to go through. I think one of the biggest highlights about all the awards, they're a national award that started, I think, approximately about six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was a national award. So it was a border market, it's the whole market of mm -hmm. um, Australia. And the first year I ranked in number eight in the top 50, um, ahead of probably some of the biggest DJs in the country, including my male counterparts. And I've ranked number one in South Australia the, the following six years above everyone in South Australia, not just the gay lesbian industry. So I guess for me, one of the biggest things is, is being accredited for something that um, is not only being a female, but also a gay lesbian female DJ, mm -hmm. um, making it in the, in the mainstream uh, market and audiences. Absolutely, it's mm. an incredible achievement. Mm. How long have you been doing it for now? 
Well, 2009 sees me DJing now for 25 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I started my uh, DJ career back at the Mars Bar in uh, 1984, I think it was. Wow, that would have been when Mars Bar was first opened. <laughs> it first reopened, yeah, and it was still a restaurant, I think, in the daytime. For those who don't know, the Mars Bar is uh, probably one of Australia's oldest gay clubs. And icons, I believe. Yes. It has, it has been around for a long time. It's still yeah. going, it won't mm. die. No. So what, what do you like to play? I don't like to stick to one style. I, I came from when house music was pretty much hitting Australian shores. Mm. It was going from you know regular pop music to to uh, to, to rave to house to trance. Mm -hmm. um, I loved house music, and like most gay men back in the early '80s, it was big diva vocals, big piano lines, mm -hmm. lots of house music, and songs about lost love and all sorts of stuff. I think my biggest audience was um, the 30th anniversary for the Sydney Gay Lesbian Mardi Gras. For an SA girl, I managed to not only do one Mardi Gras, but I think four or five Mardi Gras and two sleaze balls in Sydney and it sort of put me up there with the league of everybody else and I think the last one I or even the first RHI gig I played I think I was in tears at the end of it because it was just sort of reached that goal 10 years I was trying to get in and then when you finally actually make it you realize you've well, I've got to set another 10 years goals what's that going to well, be what is the next step <laughs> what's the next goal um, well, I always thought that if I made it to 25 years, I think that would be such a milestone and then I could decide where I wanted to go from there. I don't think I could be in clubs for the rest of my life, so I've been, the last probably couple of years, I've been cementing myself into um, my Certificate 3 in personal training. And I've been training at the gym and trying to clean up my life like most DJs do. You either go down the wayside or mm. you sort of decide to sort of clean up. Um, so I've been doing some um, gym work and studying really hard and doing part-time work at the gym. Mm -hmm. and, and um, show, show us these cans. Look at show that. us those guns. Wow. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Well, you were just saying before that uh, you've, you're uh, training for a competition. Yes, I entered um, Shane from the City Gym, who's uh, Adelaide's uh, biggest little gym. Um, obviously, the gay friendly gym. Uh, lots of gay lesbians come and train there. Um, we. He had mentioned it to me, maybe I should, after training for a couple of years, do a bodybuilding comp. And I, I'd been to a couple and I thought, you know what, I don't really think my body looks like that. And um, this year when I um, started doing my TAFE course, I kind of decided, well, maybe I should just do it just to see how it all works. Because if I have to have trained someone, it would be good that I have the knowledge and see what a body can do. So this year I entered with um, a strong round of 12 novice girls in the October long weekend. And I ranked six in uh, the novice round. Um, for my first one, so sixth place in the bodybuilding comp, so I plan to go into next year to, to win. Must so. be very punishing. So you've gone from, have a, you know, being a DJ is a pretty mm -hmm. punishing lifestyle in terms of yep. body. You've got your late nights, yep. probably don't eat that regularly, mm -hmm. uh, awake for a couple of days at a time, yep. to uh, punishing your body again with this, uh, uh, although it's healthy. Absolutely. So you're a, you're, a, um, you're a glutton for punishment? Pretty much. <laughs> I love to beat myself around a bit and I love to challenge myself Push your a lot. Limits. Absolutely. And I kind of decide that hopefully. Um, after 25 years of DJing, I get lots of gigs later to, to reappear as you know something that is that icon that has been around not only in South Australian gay lesbian scene but in the scene for so many years and set the bar mm -hmm. to come back and do cameo gigs. But I'd like to think that the next 25 years I can move on into um, personal training in the fitness industry. Great. Um, but also dabbling in music production. We've got a second or th second single out with a group that people are unaware that we're under that um, banner. Um, coming out in summer this year and we've been signed to Monster Records with one of the tunes in Germany. Just dabbling in a bit of music production as well and hopefully that our music will be played by DJs along the way and I can sort of hang up the headphones eventually. Fantastic. Mm. Well you also used to host a radio show didn't you? Mm. Mm. For Fresh FM. I did Fresh FM for I think nearly seven years and I was a part of the committee there and that was absolutely awesome. Again the profile there was, um, I think a lot of people said you know was it hard being out or you know was it did you have to be out? And I said, you know what, people kind of knew it. And I think I'm probably the most well-known Adelaide lesbian, mm -hmm. I guess. And it never really hurt me. And I think it broke down so many barriers for a lot of people, not just myself. And then um, a, a gentleman called Jason Stavely approached me when Nova went on air. So I did the Saturday night mix-up um, for three years in Nova. Um, Great. So I worked for two of the most major radio stations in, in South Australia. Absolutely. Um, mm. I mean, you were with Fresh right from the beginning, weren't you? Mm. Well, I should explain for those who don't know, um, Fresh FM features just dance music. Yes, that is correct. Uh, which is pretty, dance music is a broad label. Absolutely, and a focus on youth as well. It's mm -hmm. a youth broadcaster. I think that's one of the reasons why they got their licence, because yeah. it wasn't just one genre of people through South Australia, it was the whole youth capacity. Mm -hmm. So, 
um, and it does, does give young kids opportunities. But mm. I remember when it started, uh, dance music really it was really exploding at that mm. time when Fresh first started. Do you think it'll always have um, um, uh, the popularity that it does? Do you think? It, do you think it'll? Or do, I think do you it's notice subsided. that music goes through cycles? Yeah, music has really gone through cycles, and in the 25 years I've been playing, no matter what, you'll always have the songs that are remade, and they just keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. And you know, there's so many remixes of dance songs that I own; it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's they should be coming back. Because you know, children that are born to a fam like a family that listens to the radio or listens to dance music, therefore, psych psychologically, takes in those songs. Then when they grow older, they're funnily enough going to time warp and places like that and enjoying stuff we were enjoying 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the most amazing things that you can do with music is a lot of people don't understand that when I play, a lot of DJs don't understand what is it she's doing that they all love. Mm -hmm. And some people get it, or some people don't. But I talk to them through the music. Mm -hmm. And music's one of the most powerful mediums on the planet. We all speak it, no matter what language. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing better than standing in the middle of 10,000 people, and you're all on the same wavelength. And that feeling you get, I can, I can understand, you know, people like Michael Hutchins and anyone big, when you have 10,000 people screaming at you at one point, at one point in a song where they've got it, you know, and it comes back at you, it is the most spine-chilling feeling you'll ever feel. And um, when you've got that much control over it, it is quite emotional and it's one of the most powerful things. And I think a lot of DJs these days don't know that yet. They don't have that ability to talk mm -hmm. through the crowd and talk through the music and see a crowd and have a box of records go, how am I going to make this work? Well, you were, you were there right when I first started uh, yeah. clubbing and so I, I, hope, I hope you'll be there when I'm, uh, when I'm in my wheelchair. You know what? If I'm in the wheelchair and I'm still trying to kick it, come up and tell me. <laughs> Get over it. It's over. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Josh. My pleasure, darling. Oh my goodness, like a limbless, over-caffeinated chimpanzee sitting behind a drum kit, we're out of time. But don't despair, we've got three more great interviews coming up next week. On next week's show, Nathan reaches out and touches radio and TV funny man Adam Richard, but isn't arrested, while Ima hits the airwaves with radio producer Logan Bold and swaps small town stories with singer and cabaret icon Libby O'Donovan. Good heavens! But now to round off the show, we've got the fabulous Selena Jenkins singing My Space Junkie. Good night, everybody. Good night. This may not be my finest hour. I've got some little things to do. Yeah.